Hello again, everybody. This is Dan Clauser, and welcome back to the Journey My Mother's Son podcast. Today, I have a pilot, author, and social media influencer on the show, Kay Hall. Thanks for joining me today, Kay. Absolutely. Thrilled to be here. We're going to have some fun today. Absolutely. So um, just introduce yourself a little bit to, to my listeners. Let them know, you know, who is Kay Hall? Awesome. Yeah, my name is Kay Hall. I actually run Fly with Kay on social media. I am a 25-year-old pilot living in Houston, Texas, and I fly a beautiful 53-year-old Piper Cherokee 180 named Lil Red. Lil Red, that's cool. Um, so let's see, where do we want to start here? Let's, uh, you just published a book. Um, I did. And uh, tell me a little bit about what was the um, inspiration behind wanting to write a book? Honestly, I think part of it is when I was finally kind of establishing myself on social media, which ended up happening by accident. The only reason I even started was because I was laid off during the pandemic. I couldn't get a job as an instructor and I was literally just wasting my time on social media and not really doing anything productive. So I decided I was just going to go ahead and try, you know, I was already flying. I was already having the time of my life. And I was like, let me throw together some videos, see if people like it. The answer was yes. Now, there's a lot of things that people don't ever really know about social media until they either read about it, somebody else makes a video about it. And so I really wanted to give that insight to other people. And of course, I wanted to entertain as many people as possible. So I included some funny stories of when I was a pilot, when my student tried to kill me on takeoff, which is always an interesting conversation. And even the time that I broke my sunglasses and because of that was told I wasn't able to solo. So there was a lot of things that... I've kind of gone through, even though I am 25, I am 25, you know, I'm in the process of getting to my goals in social media, as well as in aviation. And I wanted to be able to show that side of me where the camera wasn't rolling and people would be able to find out a little bit more about me, not just the persona that I kind of give on camera. Right. Yeah. And the the title of the book is Becoming Fly with K. So it's, you know, like you said, it's really kind of that behind the scenes look as to what you know, got you to where you are on social media. So, um, you know, I know from, from watching some other interviews with you and stuff that, um, you know, you'd mentioned that a lot of, um, you know, what you've gained as far as followers and stuff on social media kind of happened by accident. Um, tell, tell me a little bit about that. I mean, that's a pretty big accident. You've got like almost 2 million followers on TikTok. You're over a hundred thousand on Instagram. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty big accident. So tell me exactly (laughs) how, uh, how that happened. Well, so long story short, I was, like I mentioned, I actually got laid off during COVID-19, during the pandemic, and it became very difficult for me to continue my flying, to be able to keep traveling and build my hours. I was at the time working towards the commercial airlines, and proficiency in currency is very, very important for you to stay a safe pilot and to eventually get a job. So we went the whole rental route and I was just spending so much money. I wasn't able to get as much flying in. And finally, we found Low Red, which was very, very exciting. She became known to millions, which I think is incredible. And I was going for a flight one day and I had some extra time before I was going to be picking up my instrument flight plan and taking off. So I decided to do a little filming. I filmed myself doing some pre-flight, a little bit of the flight, and I tried to include some radio calls. At the time, I wasn't as good at creating my content. I've definitely gotten a lot better, which is good. And that was my first quote unquote viral video. It hit over a hundred thousand views in a week. So I decided, Hey, you know, people clearly like this. It gave people the opportunity to ask questions. And I always like to say, to see a side of aviation that I don't think a lot of people know about, they know about commercial airlines. They know about flying for FedEx. Maybe they've even seen, you know, the uh, parasailers that have the little signs behind them at the beach in Florida. So I really wanted to be able to show people that you can actually get a license and just go fly around for fun. And so far, it's been working out pretty well. <laughs> that's that's pretty cool. So um, what was it that inspired you to, you know, want to fly around for fun? Um, I mean, that's a, you know, I don't know of a whole lot of other, you said you've been flying since you're 22 um, I, I don't know a whole lot of other, you know, kids that age who that's kind of their, their desire to, to jump in a little plane and, and, uh, fly around. 
So that's kind of the funny thing is I've always loved the idea of traveling for a living. And actually, before I decided I wanted to become a pilot, I did start working towards becoming a flight attendant. And I do actually talk about this in my book, but it wasn't something I was super passionate about. It was just a way that I was going to be able to get out of living paycheck to paycheck. I was finally going to be able to afford both my rent and my car insurance on time. So I was excited about that. And um, my pops actually called me out of the blue and he was telling me about this great opportunity of becoming becoming a flight attendant with Delta. And I was actually going to be mentored by one that had been there for 20 some years. And I just wasn't as excited as he expected. So he asked me point blank, what is it that you really want to do? And I told him, I said, I want to be the one flying the airplane. I want to be in front and I want to get my pilot license. And he said, let's just get to working on that then. So I did my first flight. And the second those wheels were off of that runway, I was hooked. That was 100% what I was going to do for the rest of my life. And when I got laid off and I wasn't able to do that teaching any longer or working at the commercial airlines because I don't yet qualify. I still need about roughly 300 hours or so. We found low red and it became more possible for me to do that traveling that I wanted to do. Flying up to California to visit my grandparents, flying up to Washington to visit some family, flying over to Florida just to have a couple of days in the sun. I mean, it's pretty sunny here in Texas too. Don't get me wrong, but <laughs> And uh, it just really became a huge passion of mine, just be able to fly around and enjoy myself and then create content and inspire other people from all over the world. Yeah, that's cool. So, you know, obviously we both travel a bit. Um, I'm doing it in an RV. Wheels are on the ground. Um, you're doing it in the air. And, you know, before we started recording, I said, you know, one of the things I hate more than anything else in the world is flying. Um, but again, my perspective is flying in a commercial aircraft, going through TSA, you know, yeah. all that um, not so fun stuff. So yeah. I'd imagine your perspective of flying is quite a bit different than than mine. So, Absolutely. you know, you said the minute the wheels left the runway that, that you were hooked. I mean, what was it about, um, you know, that moment in particular that you know, that had you hooked from, you know, from the start. You know, I get asked about this all the time. And honestly, this might sound bizarre. It's the freedom. It's the idea that, you know, in an hour from now, if I really wanted to go and fly somewhere, I could, I could pack a bag, I could grab my iPad, my headset and hit the plane and I'd be ready to go. And that's really the cool thing. You know, you go on a commercial flight. I actually recently went on a United flight over to Oshkosh, the AAA Air Venture Show over in Wisconsin. And uh, it took me the same amount of time to get to the airport, go through security, take the flight, get my rental car and get back to my hotel than it would have for me to fly my own airplane. And had the weather permitted, I would have flown my own airplane because it's just a preference of mine. So I would definitely say the freedoms of just being able to be like, okay, let's go. You know, it's been awesome. Yeah. So how do you go about planning the trip then? You know, you said about, you know, flying to Florida for, you know, a couple of days to get away. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what is involved in, um, you know, planning that out. Cause obviously you're not, I'm assuming you're not making it from Houston to wherever in Florida on one tank of fuel. No. So <laughs> how, how are you, um, you know, planning? Okay. I got to, you know, touch down here to refuel. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm assuming there's restrictions on how, you know, how many hours you can fly in a day. So how do you kind of put all that together? So the first thing I always do before I even start planning my trip is I'll check the weather first. I'll make sure there's not going to be any thunderstorms. There's not going to be freezing or icing levels that I'm going to have to be concerned about. And if the, all of that checks out, then I start looking at hotel and Uber pricing to make sure I can afford to go. And then if that continues to work out, I'll bring up my iPad. I actually use the app called ForeFlight, and I'll be able to pick destinations where I can find out exactly how far I can fly. So in my airplane, I have a total of 50 gallons worth of fuel, which is about five hours of flight time. I usually am on what's called an IFR flight plan, which stands for instrument flight rules, which means I am required to land with at least 45 minutes of reserve fuel, meaning I can only fly upwards or a maximum, excuse me, of four hours and 15 minutes. So just to combat that, to make it super easy, I always tell myself four hours and then it's time to land. 
Most of the time, because I have done the Florida trip so many times, I can actually land in Foley, Alabama. I'll have that 45 minutes to 60 minutes of reserve when I land, and then I can usually make it all the way over to like Orlando. If I were going to go further south, I would have to stop one more time. So that's kind of the biggest process of just figuring out how far I can fly. And when I get up to altitude, there are times where I will actually have to change the airport I was intending to land. And that's super simple. Air traffic control is super easy to talk to. <laughs> Well, no, that's, that's fascinating. I mean, because again, being the guy that is traveling with the wheels on the ground, um, mm -hmm. fuel tanks are very similar. I got a 55 gallon uh, fuel tank in the, in the RV, you got a 50 gallon tank in the, the airplane and we can probably go about the same distance on that. <laughs> yeah, probably on, so. on that <laughs> amount of fuel. Uh, your, yeah. Yours is affected a little bit by wind. Mine's affected a little bit by mountains and, you know, mm -hmm. if I'm going up a lot of inclines and stuff like that. So it's kind of, Absolutely. kind of interesting for sure. Um, what, what altitude are you flying at when you're at, you know, cruising altitude? What are you, what are you at? I'll usually be anywhere between about 4,000 to 10,000 feet. So I can take Little Red up to 12,000, which I do have to do whenever I fly over to California. When I go to Vegas, because I'm flying over those mountains, I have to make sure that I have enough distance between just to stay safe. But whenever I fly over to Florida, I try to do anywhere between like six to 9,000. It's a little bit cooler up there, which feels a lot better. And then I'll also pick my altitude according to those winds as well. Whichever one's going to be the most favorable is usually what I'm going to end up going with. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Um, so when you get to, to the airport, you so say you're checking Uber, you're checking hotels. Um, so you just like park in the aircraft, you know, like at the airport for a couple of days, like, how does that, like, this is just stuff. I'm just trying to wrap my head around how it works in, in your world. So, you know, where's Absolutely. airplanes just sitting there? Um, you know, there's no valet parking or anything like that, I'm sure. But you know, so, like, so <laughs> no, where is the not. plane while you're, while you're Ubering around uh, Orlando, Florida? See, that's the really cool thing is I do quite a bit of research about the airports that I'm going to be landing at. We talked earlier about fuel pricing and things like that. I will also look to see how much it costs to park the airplane if they have what's called a tie down fee. And really, that's just to keep the airplane secure. They'll have security at that airport and they'll make sure nobody comes to mess with it. I've seen as cheap as five dollars per night or free. When I stayed in Waco last night, they actually didn't charge me anything, which was awesome. And I have seen all the way up to like one hundred dollars per night. And those are the airports. I stay away from. <laughs> They're usually a lot bigger too. So you've got some bigger airplanes coming in. But actually, yeah, when I land, I'll just go ahead and let them know, hey, I'm going to be here either tonight or however many days. And I'll tie the airplane down. I'll chalk it so that it doesn't move around, even if the winds pick up. And then they'll keep an eye on the airplane and I can go have fun in Florida or wherever it is I landed. Yeah, that's cool. So, you know, obviously you're not landing, you know, in Orlando International Airport. So right. like when when you're searching these, you know, smaller airports that, you know, are for aircrafts like yours, um, you said you're using an app, right? Yes. And that's, um, so, so there's obviously like a whole, um, you know, kind of little airplane subculture out there of, you know, how you go about planning your, your stuff. Now, is there, is there also, um, you know, like a, a community of, of other pilots that you're, you know, interacting with on a pretty regular basis. Because I know in the RV community, that's one of the things we love the most about it is, you know, meeting other fellow RVers and, you know, people who are, you know, living full time in RVs and doing what, what we do. So is that the same thing in the aircraft community? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, quite a few of my followers are pilots as well. So they'll always give me recommendations of like, Hey, Kay, you should fly to this airport and try this at their restaurant. Or somebody actually just recently gave me the recommendation of going over to Texarkana so that I can be in two States at the same time. So I do get a lot of those cool comments and stuff on my videos. And then I'm also a part of a lot of Facebook groups where I can talk to people that fly different aircraft that are in different States, sometimes different countries. And it's just like a really cool, thing to be able to, you know, ask questions. If there's something that comes up that I'm unsure about, I can actually go and talk to the whole community as a whole and get everybody's opinion and or answers, which is actually super helpful and a lot of fun. You get to meet a lot of people. Plus when we go to the air shows, like what I was just at, that's all pilots usually. <laughs> so you get to talk to a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. And it, there, there's just something special about being in that type of community where you're with, you know, 
like-minded people and people who, you know, are understanding the language you're speaking, you know, as opposed to, you know, I mean, this conversation is great, but I'm sure there's, you know, if you're surrounded with a bunch of people like me who are just clueless and asking you questions and you're probably like, oh, what's going on? But when you're actually speaking that language, it's, it's got to be pretty, pretty special for sure. So, um, you know, being as young as you are, um, it seems like that, that community has certainly um, embraced you from, from what you're telling me. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, you always have a little negative Nancy action and stuff, but I will say everybody has been super supportive and they have really just encouraged me to try everything, whether it is flying to a different state or trying a new experience. The support I got from writing my book was absolutely insane, way more than I expected and so appreciated, which was awesome. But I will say the other thing, I just want to pipe back really quick to what you said. I never get tired of explaining it because I am a certified flight instructor with my certified flight instructor instrument, which means I can teach. So I actually really enjoy telling people who don't have any idea about general aviation. And I think that that's why I have the following that I do, because most of my lives are talking to people who have no idea what I'm saying. And I think that that's really cool. (laughs) Yeah. So have you ever had anything come up where, you know, you've had something come up with the aircraft mid flight where you've had to, you know, make a landing that that wasn't expected? And then how does that work? You know, is that, you know, similar again to me having to find an emergency spot to change a tire in the RV or like how how does that work on your end in the in the air world? So yes, I have actually had a couple experiences and I will tell you about one of them here in a second. As a pilot, especially for the kind of airplane that I am in, I am taught specifically how to handle emergency situations. So let's say I'm flying along, I'm at 6,000 feet and I lose my engine. I actually have a mental checklist. It's actually called the ABCD checklist, which I will go through in a second, but it tells me exactly how to get my airplane safely on the ground. So the A actually stands for airspeed and I'm gonna establish my best glide speed. Basically, my beautiful airplane turns into a glider. I do not carry a parachute on board. People are always asking that. So I figured I'd answer that question. Now, the next one is going to be B, best place to land. I'm obviously looking for an airport if I can find one. Otherwise, I'm going to be looking for an open field that hasn't been recently plowed. So it won't have those big divots. And then hopefully I'll make it down to the ground safely. At 6,000 feet, I would have some time to go through my checklist just to make sure, you know, if there's something that I accidentally turned off or just double check everything, make sure that there's nothing I can fix before declaring that emergency, which is what that D stands for. So then I'll talk to air traffic control, who is ATC, and let them know, hey, Cherokee 7738 November, mayday, 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 declaring an emergency. They will help in any way that they can. But more than anything, they're just watching me now to make sure that they can see where I land so they can send out emergency help right away. So there have been a couple instances. Luckily, I've never had to make an emergency landing in low red. I have been able to solve the problem and I've never actually had to make an emergency landing at all. However, when I was an instructor, I was flying around and we were coming back in to land. And we do this thing called flying the traffic pattern. So you take off and you actually just make like a little rectangle around the airport and then you come back in and land. And it's a really great way for students and instructors to practice their takeoff and landings without spending a bunch of time and energy and gas, which is good. (laughs) We don't like to waste gas if we don't have to. So we're coming back into land and all of a sudden my oil pressure goes to zero. So as the instructor on board, that is the situation in which I have to actually grab those controls. So I declare my flight controls and I immediately let tower know that I wasn't declaring a state of emergency, but I was requesting priority because this was a busy airport. If I declare an emergency, they send everybody away. Lots of paperwork, lots of questions, lots of time. So by saying priority, they knew I had a problem, but it wasn't to the point where I needed to declare an emergency. So I was cleared to come into land. Everything was fine. And I actually write about this in my book. I originally got written up for telling them that there was a problem in my airplane because when aircraft mechanics, my A&Ps, went to go and check the airplane, they said there was nothing wrong with it. They never took it off the ground. So two days later, another instructor and another student actually leave that traffic pattern area to go and practice some other flying maneuvers. And they had to declare an emergency and make an emergency landing. So then they ripped up my little form where I'd gotten written up and that was good. (laughs) But other than that, we've been pretty good so far. Yeah. So, So how big is your aircraft? 
like um, as far as how many people can it seat? Um, yeah, how many people can it seat? And then like like tail to, to nose, like what's the, the length of it? I wish I knew, to be completely honest, I don't, but I will tell you, we can see up to four people. It is a tight squeeze, and um, when we are fully loaded, gas, people, travel luggage, all that good stuff, about 2,400 pounds is going to be my max. So she's a pretty good size. Um, I can show you kind of a photo right there. Okay. So the wings would come out to probably right about here or so. Gotcha. But gotcha. she's cute. <laughs> yeah. And when, uh, like, so how fast are you flying, um, you know, when you're taking one of those, one of those trips, you know, your Texas to Florida trip we'll use as an example. Okay. My average is usually going to be anywhere between like 125 miles per hour to 135 miles per hour. However, on days like today where the wind is working against me, I was rocking 105. So it did take me quite a bit longer, but my average is usually between 125 and 135. And one other thing you might have a few people comment on is most airplanes nowadays are configured in knots. But when my airplane was built in 1968, they did still use miles per hour. So if anybody's going to leave a comment, comment and tell him that I should have said not. It actually is miles per hour. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. So um, how, how did you find, um, you know, the plane you're using now? Again, you said it's, you know, night, you know, 1968. Mm -hmm. um, so how, like, and I guess even that, again, being the guy that's just completely ignorant to this world <laughs> is, uh, you know, I mean, when you're looking at, a, at an aircraft that um, you know, that old, uh, is it similar to a car, you know, where there's so many hours on it, so many, you know, miles on it. I mean, how are you judging that, that, you know, you're okay with buying a, you know, 50 plus year old aircraft? Very good question. I actually get asked this pretty often and I will say, so how we found the airplane is a website called tradeaplane.com. And the reason why that's really important is because this website actually gives you all of the specs. It tells you what your performance capabilities are. It tells you your average airspeed that you're going to be getting, how much weight you can carry, uh, usable and unusable, which is totally different. Don't worry about that. <laughs> and uh, the nice thing about that is, is that we were able to see exactly how much time was on the engine. So there is like a total major overhaul sometimes that you will have to do. And uh, that really just depends on what your AMP recommends. So for us, it's probably going to be at about 2,500 hours. Right now, I think we're at about 16 to 1,700. So we still have quite a bit of time, which is good. Um, and that's basically where they will just overhaul the entire engine. They'll make sure that everything is still looking good. They'll fix what they need to, all that jazz. I'm not an a &P, so it's one of those things where it's just like, that's what they tell me. So it makes sense to me. That's what I learned. <laughs> but as far as like the actual details of it, that's pretty much all I got. <laughs> yeah. And then you said, um, <clears throat> you know, and again, we'll just kind of keep going back to this, this Texas to Florida trip. Um, so you, you say you'll normally stop in Alabama to, to refuel. And I'm guessing, you know, when you're stopping in for fuel, you're also, you know, taking a little break and, you know, potty break and all that fun stuff. Um, how, how many hours, um, you know, so like what time are you leaving Texas in the morning? What time do you actually end up in Alabama? And then it's, that's the only stop you're making on that trip or is there another stop before you get to Orlando? No, that'll usually be the only one unless the winds are really bad. Gotcha. So yeah. how much time's going in between each of those stops? And, and like, once you're ready to take off again in Alabama, uh, I'm, I'm assuming it's not just as easy as, you know, me pulling into the pilot and fueling up and pulling out of the, you know, back onto the, the highway. I'm guessing you're getting in line and getting approval from the tower as to when you can take off. And, you know, what's that lag like? And how are you, you know, working through that? So I like to leave early in the morning when so that I can actually, you know, claim some of that nighttime, which is really good for pilots to fly in the dark and get used to not really seeing much outside. So I will try to fly anywhere between like four to six a.m. out of here, which means four hours later, I'm like landing at like 
10 a.m. or so. It's actually pretty quick where I land in Alabama because it is not towered. So I really only have to talk to the other pilots and it's not a super busy airport. So interestingly enough, I pull off the runway, I taxi, I stop at the gas pumps, they fill me up and then I can just taxi out and take back off. It's super easy. Now, if I am at a controlled airport with a tower, it is a lot longer, usually anywhere between 20 to 30 minutes or so for, you know, to get in and to get out. Um, but it's actually not that bad. It gives me time to get a few steps in. You know, we always love getting steps in, especially because I'm going to sit in the airplane for about eight hours, usually on a trip to Florida. Um, but yeah, I try to turn and burn pretty quickly <laughs> because I'm usually like really excited. OK, I finally got my fuel stop done Four more hours and I'm hitting a beach or I'm going to Disney Springs or something like that. So yeah, it's actually not bad. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. And what is the limit that you can fly in a day? Like how many hours are, are you allowed to fly in a day? So I actually don't have a limit as a private pilot. So I'm just kind of doing my own thing. But for an instructor, only eight hours. So if I were back to teaching, I would only be able to fly eight hours. And I think the commercial airliners do have a limit as well, but I don't know for sure what it is. Not yet. Maybe someday. <laughs> so so what's the... Uh... What's the future hold for Kay? Are you still looking to get into commercial airline or because of the way your social media stuff has taken off, you're kind of comfortable where you are right now and staying, you know, private and you know, doing your little thing? What What's the future looking like for you? You know, that's the funny thing is I have so much fun with what I'm doing and just the fact that I am able to inspire so many people. I mean, I'm getting emails and direct messages and comments every single day saying, I watched your live this morning or I saw this video and I went and did an introductory flight or I'm going to start becoming a pilot. And even though I would love to be a commercial airliner, I feel like I am making more of a positive impact with my social media and being able to inspire people, even if it's not aviation, just to work towards any kind of goal that they've ever had. I, it's, it's one of those things where it's like you win some, you lose some and both scenarios would be absolutely amazing. But I think if I had my choice at this point, it would be continue with social media, continue to build my hours and then maybe get the best of both worlds and just do both. I think that that would be incredible. And I get to meet a lot more people too. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I love that just that, you know, part of what you want to do is inspire others to, again, not necessarily get into aviation, but do whatever it is they want to do. And that's you know, mm -hmm. very similar to, you know, the journey that we're on as well is, you know, Hey, maybe you don't need to go out and, you know, sell your house and all of your stuff and, and buy an RV and, and travel around the country, but you also don't have to work in a nine to five dead end job. Um, six, you know, five days a week as well. So find Absolutely. what it is that you want to do and, and do it. Um, so I love that that's part of your message to, you know, to inspire and, and uh, you know, just help others kind of get over that hump and understand that there is more to life than, than what we're, we're experiencing. And it's, you know, it's funny how you, you took, you know, what many would look like a setback of being, you know, laid off or losing your job during COVID and at a, you know, a very young age showing, you know, some resiliency to say, okay, well, this happened. How am I going to, you know, make the best of this? How am I going to make, you know, lemonade out of these lemons that life just threw at me? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what was it that, you know, again, at a very young age, I mean, there's not many, you know, I'm going to call you a kid because I'm, I'm older than you. <laughs> That's I've got, fine. <laughs> got kids and I've got kids that are older than you. So, um, That's awesome. but you know, what was it that again, at a very young age, you know, being able to have that resiliency to say, you know what, this isn't the end of the world. I I'm going to figure this out. I mean, where did that come from for you? Well, I will say, you know, I'm human too. And when it first happened, it was devastating. There had been hundreds of instructors jobs available to me. And I don't know if I mentioned this or not. I actually was already employed with American Airlines when I was laid off. So I was a part of what was called the Envoy Cadet Program, which basically meant that I had a job as soon as I got to 1,500 hours. So at the time I was working in Arizona and my family had just relocated here to Texas. And I'm very family oriented. Everybody knows this. <laughs> and 
so I wanted to be closer to them. So I took a transfer. Everything was going according to plan. I had my offer letter. I had an apartment picked out. I was super excited. And then I got an email the following day while I was sipping my coffee saying that they had decided to halt on accepting my transfer. So it's like, okay, you know what? Not that big of a deal. We'll wait it out. Well, as we know, COVID-19 just can continue to get worse and worse and worse. And people stopped wanting to do anything. They stopped wanting to spend money and leave their house. And that flight school that I took the transfer from originally actually ended up shutting its doors like two and a half months later. So that job never came back. And there were so many instructor jobs that were available at the time. It was like, okay, I'll just keep waiting and it's going to be fine. And they all disappeared overnight. And so I had no job. I was back to living with mom and dad because I couldn't afford an apartment anymore. Nobody wanted to, you know, take a chance on a 24 year old or however it was, 23. (laughs) Time flies, I tell you. And uh, ultimately it got very, very sad for me for a while. You know, I won't say it was depressed, but I will say I just didn't have that energy and that light that my family was used to seeing. So we figured out a way for me to still be able to fly. We started renting aircraft, but on beautiful days where it was perfect to go fly for eight hours, it was booked up. So it became harder and harder. When we found Little Red, everything changed for me. I was able to get up every morning and go for a flight and do the one thing that I always loved to do. And then social media, like I've mentioned, (laughs) happened by accident. And it just gave me more to look forward to every single day. So I will say it was definitely down quite a bit, but my family really was super supportive and they definitely helped me bounce back and get ahead. And I would say that I'm definitely ahead right now. I've been very, very blessed to be kind of where I am and with all of the opportunities and just everything that's been going on has just been incredible. Yeah, no, I love that. And I love the fact that, you know, having that strong, you know, family support that that, you know, really helped you quite a bit through, uh, through that whole thing. But again, kudos to you because you know, a lot of people, it's, it is tough and, and, you know, it, it's tough for all of us in that situation, but we truly do have to figure out how to, how to overcome it and how to step up and, and make the best of it. So kudos to you for, for being able to do that. And then just taking it to the next level as well. You know, <laughs> just, you didn't just get through it. Like you got through it and then took off. So kudos to you for sure. So I like that little pun you said just now, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How about it? How That's about awesome. it? Um, so um, anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to, you know, that you'd like to talk about before we get to my final question? Of course. I actually do want to mention one more time in the book. And again, this is my story. It's my journey. It's not just about being a pilot. It's not just about social media. It's about how I was able to finally make the decision that I was tired of living paycheck to paycheck and not being able to afford the bare necessities to have a good life. And when I finally decided I wanted to work towards something, I knew that hard work was the only way I was going to be successful. And I really want people, if they do decide to pick up the book, even if they just read the first chapter, to really be able to see that even though I am in many people's eyes very successful, some would call me a celebrity, some would just call me a social media influencer, content creator to each their own. I am Kay. I'm a regular person. And I really wanted to be able to share my story so that if there are people out there that are like, I can never get out of what I'm doing. I can never get away from this. That's not true. You just have to make the decision for yourself that you are ready to try. And trying is ultimately what's going to help you be successful. I love that. That's a great message. Great message. Um, One other thing I, I just thought of as we were, as you were kind of talking about that, I remember watching another interview that you did and um, you, you said kind of the, the double-edged sword with being, you know, social media influencer and having all these followers is that you, you have all these friends, but yet you can't interact with them in person in a lot of times. Um, mm-hmm. What, what's it like when you do, um, you know, get to interact with someone that's, that's been following you on, on social media, you know, in person, what, what's that, you know, what type of feeling does that give you? So I actually, I told you, I went to the Oshkosh air 
venture show. And I did a meet and greet. I wanted to give people the opportunity to come over and say hi. And you would not believe how many people were so shy when they walked up. You know, they don't know how to react when they actually see me in person, which is just mind blowing to me. (laughs) But it just, it really validates all of the hard work that I've put in, all of the tears that I shed, all of the times where I just wanted to quit and give up and thought that nobody cared about the content. It tells me, even if I have a bad day, there are people out there that are having a bad day too, that are looking forward to that video that they think I'm going to post, or if I'm going to go live and just sit there and talk to them and being able to have those like conversations, uh, it kind of brings tears to my eyes. Honestly, it's just, it's so validating. And it really just shows me, you know, what? just keep going because you are making a difference in someone's life. And to be able to see that in person, absolutely breathtaking. (laughs) Uh, I, I can relate to that because, you know, before we started traveling, you know, I coached for 30 years and um, one of the greatest blessings that um, Sandy and I have had in our travels is being able to reconnect with some of my old players who are literally, you know, scattered throughout the country and, you know, being able to, you know, see, um, you know, and hear them tell me what I did for them, you know, over the years I'd coached them and, and what they're doing um, out there in the world today is, is incredibly um, fulfilling for sure. So I can completely understand what you're talking about when, you know, when you get that in-person interaction for sure. So what, um, how, how do you put, um, you know, cause let's face it with any social media influencer out there, you're going to have those negative Nancy's like you, you mentioned earlier, how, yes. you know, how do you deal with that? Is it just like, all right, I, you know, there's, you know, a thousand positive comments here. And then there's these, you know, four people who want to be a downer today. I mean, how do you just get past that and, and focus on all the positive and not, because I think as humans, a lot of times it's only natural for us to be drawn to that negative, even though that is a tiny, tiny portion of what is actually going on. That's what we end up focusing on. But how, how do you deal with that? You know, that's the funny thing is when I was first getting started, it was very, very hard. I'd see those comments and I dwell on them. You know, people would tell me your makeup looks weird. And then I try to figure out, okay, well, what do they not like about my makeup? And I would focus so intently on them that all of those positive comments in those people's lives that they were saying I was changing, I wasn't paying attention to. And so I sat down with my family and I was like, you know what, let's just do something different. I'm going to go through all of the comments. And if I see one I don't like, I'm just going to delete it you know what? It doesn't need to be there. We don't need that kind of engagement in that interaction. Now we don't do that anymore because I can focus on all the positive comments, but it really just was one of those things where I woke up one day and I was like, I literally have 1.1 million people following me from all over the world. And you know what? Even if 300,000 of them are following me because they don't like me, they're still here. Whether they want to come and they just want to be negative and they want to say mean things and just try to get my attention almost makes me sad in a weird way because I feel like those people might be just having a bad day or maybe they just felt like they were dealt a bad hand in life and they just want to try to bring somebody else down because they're sad too. And when I started trying to think about how they might feel when they left that comment, it started to bother me less and less. Now, when I get emails saying that I should, you know, crash and burn and die, that's a little different. That does happen. I do get those comments still every once in a while as well. Um, But those I just completely delete. I don't even look at them anymore. (laughs) Those don't affect me. But it's been it's been hard, but it definitely got a lot easier. And uh, interestingly enough, I had three people go and leave me a negative review on my book on Amazon the other day. And their comments that they left in their review literally said, you couldn't pay me to open the book. They never bought it. They found a way to go and try to hurt me and try to get some attention by leaving me a bad review on my book, hoping that that would work. And you know what? It did. And I hate that it did. It really brought me down and it was a terrible day, but I also went live that day and I talked to my followers and I talked to my fans and they brought me back up. So it just shows, you know, you might have one or two people that are going to be negative, but if you have a hundred that are positive, just have to try to get into the mindset of those are the people you want to talk to anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's a great point. And, and, you know, sadly when people, like that or making those type of comments it really is more 
about something that's going on in their life um, mm -hmm. as opposed to what you're doing. So um, continue to do what you're doing and uh, you know, don't, don't worry about the, you know, the three negative comments or negative reviews that are, <laughs> that are out well, there. I appreciate it. I now have like 36 something positive ones. So my fans rallied behind me, which was incredible. And one other cool thing that happened is I told you I was in Waco last night. I had a fan actually comment on one of my videos saying, I saw a little red at the airport that I was at. And they were so excited. You could see it just in the way that they typed that comment. And they went and put it on like five videos just to make sure I saw it. But that's the thing. That's why I'm doing this. I'm inspiring people and I'm just trying to make sure that my content is entertaining and uplifting. I'm not that person that's going to come on and cry on the camera all the time. I have done that once and that's just because I wanted to be real with my followers. But ultimately, I'm just trying to bring people up and keep them entertained and maybe make them laugh a little. That'd be nice. <laughs> cool. Cool. So, Kay, how do my listeners find you? Um, where's, you know, where can they get the book? Where can they, you know, connect with you? Um, just give out all the, all the spots where they can find Kay. Yeah, absolutely. So I am on all social media platforms. You can find me on Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, and of course, my pride and joy, TikTok at fly with K. So F L Y W I T H K A Y. And it's the same across all platforms. I tried to make it super easy. I do also have a website. If you just want to go to flywithk.com, you can also find all my stuff there. I even sell some cool t-shirts if you want to check those out. And then to find the book, all you have to do is go to your local Amazon. So don't go to amazon.com, amazon.uk. If you're in the United Kingdom, type in becoming fly with K and it should pop up for you. I've got an ebook, a paperback and a hardcover available. Awesome. Okay, I really appreciated uh, having you on the show. So brings us to our final question. Uh, the subtitle of the podcast, as you know, is many little people in many little places. And it's derived from the opening lyrics of the song Gloria by Michael Fronte, which go, when many little people in many little places do many little things, then the whole world changes. So what's one of the little things that Kay's doing to make the world a little bit better place? I think, honestly, I am just trying to inspire people. Again, going back to not just about getting into aviation, but just pursuing something that they've ever dreamt about. You know, I get comments all the time. I wanted to be a pilot when I was 15 years old. Here I am 40 and I'm going on my first flight because of you. It's definitely working and it just makes me feel so much better. And I even got to talk to a school over in Indonesia. It was an all girls school. I went ahead and just did the interview. It was absolutely incredible. All of them were already following me. So it re felt really cool that they were able to see me just talk directly to them, but to address some comments and some questions and to just let them know even if people tell you you can't do something, you don't ever have to listen to them. You just have to decide you want to do it and work towards that goal. Even if it takes you five years, if you're successful, that's all that matters. Timelines don't matter in my opinion. And that's what I always try to tell anybody that ever asks me for advice about anything. If it's something you're passionate about, and as long as you keep working towards it and you work hard, doesn't matter how long it takes you to succeed. Okay, again, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate you taking the time. For folks out there listening, be sure to check out my other podcasts and blogs at journeymymotherson.com or danclauser.com. Hop on over to Amazon, pick up a copy of Kay's book, pick up a copy of my book, The Journey of My Mother's Son, Volume 1. And uh, again, Kay, really appreciate the conversation. Appreciate you taking the time to join me today. Absolutely. I had a blast. It was so good to talk with you, Dan. And thank you so much for having me on. Maybe I'll talk to you again soon. <laughs> you bet. Perfect.